We'll get into the message today, the power of thanksgiving. Power of thanksgiving. And many of you know, pretty much all of you, my guess, is that I was gone for a few weeks in Kenya. And some had asked me if I'm going to give a report. I don't want to take more than just a couple minutes, to, but I will tell you this, that there's a lot of momentum there now, the work that we are doing in Kenya in our third trip. And kind of something I was just kind of touched with, just through conversation with the other men while we were there, I was talking about John 15, 5, and I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I was telling them it takes about three years for a vine to start bearing fruit. Later on that evening, we had realized... Um, in three trips, three years, the first was kind of planting, the second was pruning, and this, this one was producing. There was a lot of production. The motorbikes were presented to our men. We're going to be uh, purchasing three acres of land to produce crops for our people. And um, we had a lot of great praise reports. Um, things, some, one gentleman in particular has said he had over 50 people coming to his church since we'd been there. And um, we also heard that it was a different gospel that we preached that that's the gospel they need in Africa, which I've known that for a while now. So glory to God for those things. And um, looking forward to keep in prayer our ambassador, Max Odunga, if you came to the Kenya night. He has a visa interview December 20th, and it's very hard to get the visa the first time, but if he's able to get it, then we will be bringing him over here, God willing, and have our next Kenya night to build on that momentum. With that being said, a couple other things briefly. Um, I mentioned the Cabreras. I forgot to mention February 18th, we'll have a Follow the Cloud Rescue and Revive ministry concert here. They'll be in concert that evening as well. So good to work with the body of Christ. Good to work with the entirety of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is big. It spans across the globe. You could go to Kenya. You could go to India. You could go to Turkey. You could go anywhere. And if you have the same father, you'll recognize one another in the spirit. Even if you don't speak the same language, you'll know by the Spirit that resides in you in the form of the Holy Spirit, that you have the same Heavenly Father. That's such a wonderful, beautiful thing about our Lord. Let's pray. Then we're going to get into it's a topical, and here's why. And we'll get back into James next week, and we're probably three-quarters done with the book of James. Personal testimony, my favorite holiday is Thanksgiving. Why? Simplicity. To me, just me, and I hope you don't get mad at me, To me, Thanksgiving is really the spirit of Christmas. It's the simplicity that's in Christ. Uh, Christmas has become commercialized chaos, if we're honest. That's so anti-Christ. That's so opposite of our Lord. A manger, Bethlehem, the journey to Bethlehem. I don't see chaos with the coming of our Lord. But Thanksgiving, the simplicity, just reflecting back on the goodness of God, all he's given us, the friendships, the family, our health, the list goes on and on. Taking time as hopefully family and friends to come together and break bread together. Not going nuts, in fact, slowing down. Making sure, you know, unless you go to Black Friday, if they still do that, where you skip over Thanksgiving, you're out waiting in lines fighting with people. Thanksgiving should not be skipped over. In fact, why is it skipped over? Because we're an unthankful culture now. Entitlement, laziness, indulgence has made us grow thankless as a society. God forbid that that's the case as a church or as the universal church of Jesus Christ. Interesting enough, today in my morning Sunday, Sunday morning routine, and I'm driving to my High Falls office, and I was listening to a pastor tell some statistics. In 2021, the average American income was $71,000. And if you make $71,000, you are in the top 4% of the entire world income. The average income in the entirety of the world in 2021 was $9,000. God forbid that we would be an unthankful people. We have been given so much, and then the question would be why? To give unto others. We have been given so we can give. Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you, good measure heaping over Freely receive, freely give. You know, it's difficult when you go to places like Kenya that has so little not to give, to be honest with you. You want to give because there you could give an amount of money for them that would be an entire week, but for you, it's not even a day's wages. One of the things I'd mentioned is we went in Kitale, Kenya, which is called the breadbasket of Kenya because it's very high in 
crop production, very green. We went, the three, other two men I was with, the other three men, our ambassador, Max, and we went to see this land that we'll be renting. Now listen to me, three acres, if you have any idea of acreage, three acres of land, three. We will, by God's grace, we met with the person, and guess what the name of the person was we met with? Emmanuel, God with us. No coincidence. As we prayed and we walked the land, Three acres of land in Kenya, acres, cost the equivalent of what it would feed my family for one week. Three acres of land. Ought we not to be thankful? Ought we not to be a people of thanksgiving? Should we not be skipping over a time to reflect on all that God has given us and to praise him and to thank him for it? And I'm not trying to coerce you or force you into buying into a vision or to go to Kenya. You may not need to. You could simply go down to Monroe Avenue where people sleep underneath the old Monroe Ave Theater alcove. You could simply go down maybe to your own neighborhood and help that person that nobody else helps. That's a way you could say thanks unto the Lord this Thanksgiving, this holiday season. With that in mind, we're going to look at about five or six different passages that have to do with thanks today, and that's why, again, I've entitled the sermon, The Power of of thanksgiving. The first one, briefly, Psalm 92.1. Psalm 92.1 simply says this, and I'll read six verses. It says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto your name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night, upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, has made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish or stupid, foolish man knows not, neither does a fool understand this. Very simply put, we're instructed in Psalm 92.1 that giving thanks is simply a good thing to do unto the Lord. Have you ever felt bad giving thanks to God? I mean, have you ever thanked God, Lord, thank you so much for this meal? Oh, man, I feel, I don't know, something doesn't feel right about that. Never. Why? Because it should be like breathing. I've tried to teach my children this. Maybe I've failed. I've tried to teach not only my my children this, but students when I was teaching at different schools. Giving thanks should be like breathing. It would amaze me at the school I was at last that when I was at the door greeting the people as the security officer that was part of my role, I would open up the door and student after student, after student, would walk right by me and say nothing. Now you say, well, why? Do you expect the thanks? Yes, simply because it should be like breathing. When someone provides a service unto you, guess what you say? Thank you. And you'll never feel bad about it. Again, I challenge you, have you ever felt bad about giving thanks unto the Lord? I never have. Never have. And so in its simplest terms, we give thanks because it's good. And goodness is a fruit of God's spirit, Galatians 5.22. It's one of those nine fruits of God's spirit, goodness. And when you give thanks, you're walking, fulfilling, using that spirit, that fruit of God's spirit, which is goodness. And it's a wonderful thing. Let's look at Psalm 100. This is a very well-known psalm. And before we do, I want to read to you A nice Thanksgiving story. Everybody reads Christmas stories. They're great. I'm going to read to you a Thanksgiving story. This is by James Baldwin. This short story is from his book, 50 Famous People, a book of short stories. This was 1912. Wow, what a different time it was back then. What a different time. Not that I was around back then, but I know it was a different time. It was much better in a lot of ways. In Richmond, Virginia, one Saturday morning, an old man went into the market to buy something. He was dressed plainly, but his coat was worn and his hat was dingy. On his arm, he carried a small basket. I wish to get a fowl for tomorrow's dinner. That's a bird, by the way, for those of you that don't know. The market man showed him a fat turkey, plump and white, ready for roasting. Ah, that is just what I want, said the old man. My wife will be delighted with it. He asked the price and paid for it. The market man wrapped a paper around it and put it in the basket. Just then, a young man stepped up. I will take one of those turkeys, he said. He was dressed in fine style and carried a small cane. Shall I wrap it for you, asked the market man. Yes, here is your money, answered the young gentleman. 
and send it to my house at once. I cannot do that, said the market man. My errand boy is sick today. There's no one else to send. Besides, it is not our custom to deliver goods. Then how am I to get it home, asked the young gentleman. Well, I suppose you'll have to carry it yourself, said the market man. It's not heavy. Carry it myself? Who do you think I am? Fancy me carrying a turkey along the street, said the young gentleman, and he began to grow very angry. The old man who had bought the first turkey was standing quite near, and he had heard all that was said. Excuse me, sir, he said, but may I ask where you live? I live at number 39 Blank Street, answered the young gentleman, and my name is Johnson. Well, that is lucky, said the old man, smiling. I happen to be going that way. I will carry your turkey if you allow me. Oh, certainly, said Mr. Johnson. Here it is. You may follow me. When they reached Mr. Johnson's house, the old man politely handed him the turkey and turned to go. Here, my friend, what shall I pay you, said the young gentleman. Oh, nothing, sir, nothing, answered the old man. It was no trouble to me, and you are welcome. He bowed and went on. Young Mr. Johnson looked after him and wondered. Then he turned and walked briskly back to the market. Who was that polite old gentleman who carried my turkey for me, asked the market man. Oh, that is John Marshall, Chief Justice of the United States. He is one of the greatest men in our country, was the answer. The young gentleman was surprised and ashamed. Why did he offer to carry my turkey, he said. He wished to teach you a lesson, answered the market man. What sort of lesson? He wished to teach you that no man should feel himself too fine to carry his own packages. Oh, no, said another man who had seen and heard it all. Judge Marshall carried the turkey simply because... He wished to be kind and obliging. That is his way. And that ought to be our way. Kind, helpful, thankful, not taking things for granted. And maybe that's, there's opportunities for us, as Bob had mentioned, with family members and friends this Thanksgiving to do that. To go the extra mile like Jesus has instructed us to do. To do a little bit more, even when you don't want to, to bring glory to God. With that being said, Psalm 100, well known. In fact, I'll probably give a devotion on this Wednesday night, but we won't go through the whole thing. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates, how? With thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. When you enter into the gates of the temple, and I know Tom was going over the temple, but this is just a brief common sense truth. Entering the gates, that's the entry point of getting into the public place of worship, which were the courts. So how do we now, as the temples of God, how do we enter in to the gates? We enter into God's presence with thanksgiving. You enter in with thanksgiving. I just asked Will and Angela, because this morning I played it, that old hymn, Give Thanks. What an awesome reminder. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks because he's given us Jesus Christ our Lord. We're going to end, I, I pray, the Wednesday service with that song. What a reminder. When you give thanks, you can enter in. That's the beginning of entering into the presence of God with a thankful heart. With a thankful heart. And you know what the challenge is? When you don't want to, when you don't want to be thankful to God because you're going through something, you're going through a trial, you're going through some obstacles, some challenges, to still enter into the gates of God's presence with a thankful heart, with thanksgiving. It's not easy to do. It's not natural. It's supernatural. But if you can just press in and press through, you'll see God honor that. You'll see God honor that. You know, recently... There was something going on with me. I'm not going to get into it, but something going on with me. And, and finally, it was like this, this switch went off. I was in Duncan. Okay, I like Duncan Donuts for coffee. And I was in there. I was just having a little quiet time. And I was preparing for this. I was reading this. And I said, you know, I've never thanked God for what I'm doing. I'm going to thank God for this. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to thank God for what I'm going through right now. And I came home and I told my wife, I said, Les, we need to thank God for this now. We need to thank God. And would you know, would you know, the things switched. Things changed. For the first time during this trial, we'll call it, a flip was switched. Could it be because I wasn't thanking God for what he was putting us through? 
Could it be that? Possibly, I don't know. But I know this, God's word is God's will. God's word does God's work, and we just read it. And the psalmist instructs us, enter in, enter in to his gates. How? With thanksgiving. Then get into a deeper place, the courts. How? With praise. And be thankful. And when you're thankful, what do you do? You bless his name. There's a formula there. One of the signs of the last days is that men would become unthankful. And isn't that so true? Unthankful. How can you have so little in some of these undeveloped countries and be so spirit-filled and happy and we have so much here and be so unthankful? That's the problem. That's the problem. Excess, indulgence, apathy. Let's look at Luke 17, the ten lepers. Luke 17. What else does giving thanks do? Luke 17, you know this passage very, very well. Ten lepers are healed, and Jesus is passing through. And as he's passing through, there's these ten lepers that stand afar off, and they lift up their voices and say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And just one of them, that's a tithe, just 10%, just one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And of course, he was a Samaritan, those that the Jewish people hated. And Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Where are the other nine? There's none that came back. And in giving thanks, this one leper gave glory to God by saying, thank you for healing me. See, thankfulness should be part of our everyday language and speech. Thank you, God. We should begin entering into his gates with, thank you, Lord, that you even allowed me to wake up today. I remember hearing Chuck Swindoll, I think it was. One of them. I think it was Chuck Swindoll. He said, every day I wake up, I get out of my bed, I drop to my knees, and I thank God. It's because of his mercy that we're not consumed, it says in Lamentations. It's only because of God's mercy that we even woke up today. And yet we take it for granted. We take it for granted. Do you know a lot of it has to do with perspective? And as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict goes on, can I tell you, quite honestly, for 16 days, it rarely, if at all, entered my mind when I was in Kenya. Why? Because people are trying to get food. They're trying to survive, you see? They're just trying to live. It's all perspective. What lens are we looking through? God, give us your eyes. Let us see a global perspective. Let us see people made in your image. Don't get me wrong, that's highly important, I understand. But it is all perspective. That conflict is not going to be as important to you if you were literally, literally trying to find food to survive. And there's many people around the world that are. And we have our turkeys and our stuffing and our mashed potatoes and our cranberry sauce. And the list goes on and on. Can we think about someone else? Can we be like the one leper that comes back and says, thank you, God, for blessing me. And because you have, I'm going to give to somebody else. My wife will say to me, she said, well, we don't live in Africa. You're right. And because we're placed in America, we should be helping all of these other places that don't have nearly as much as we do. Amen? I hope you agree with that because God agrees with that. Anybody who has been blessed in any way, financially, maybe you've been giving property, whatever it is, you should be thinking of the people of God and you should just be thinking about people in general. Not building bigger barns. Not making a bigger portfolio. If God has blessed you, he's blessed you for a reason, to bless others with your time, with your talents, with your money, with all of it. Some of you are thinking, man, I wish this guy was in Kenya one more week. <laughs> That's what happens when you go to places like Kenya. You get a different perspective. That's why God said go. That's why he said go into all the world. Go to Jerusalem. 
Go to the heart of the city. Go to Samaria. Go to Judea. Go to the uttermost parts of the world. It brings glory to God. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. A couple more passages we'll look at. First Thessalonians 5, 18, giving thanks in everything, in all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know who you is? You. Me. That's who it is. Well, I wonder what the will of God is. Mean, I don't know. Who should I, who is the person I'm supposed to marry? Uh, where am I supposed to move to? Where am I supposed to live? What job am I supposed to do? What I'm going to tell you the will of God today. The bullseye of God's will is be thankful in all things, good or bad, mountaintop or valley. Be thankful. That is the bullseye of God's will. Start there. Seek first the kingdom. He'll add all those other things onto you. Hit the bullseye. Be thankful in all things. You're having a difficult time at work? Start to praise God. Enter into his courts with thanksgiving. You're going to have difficulty with your marriage? Start to get on your knees and thank God he's given you a spouse and he's making you into his image. That's how you do it. That's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you and concerning me. You say that's too simple. You see, you're missing it. You're missing the simplicity that's in Christ. God will provide. God is Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Shema. Jehovah Shalom. God will provide. Be thankful in all things. Jesus said, you will have trial and tribulation. Be of good cheer. The psalmist says, the shepherd psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you'll be with me, God. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You're going to go through valleys in life. You're going to go through hardships in life. Why are we surprised? It should be expected. Listen to this. I read this once before. I know because it was on my bulletin board. You know George Mueller, the director of the Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England. Well, well known testimony here. He's running the orphanage, and this is just a brief testimony. The children are dressed and ready for school, but there's no food for them to eat. The house mother of the orphanage informed George Mueller. George asked her to take the 300 children, quite a few, into the dining room and have them sit at the table. He thanked God for the food and waited. George knew God would provide for the children as he always did. Within minutes, a baker knocked on the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. Soon there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed. He asked George if he could use some free milk. George smiled at, as the milkman brought in 10 large cans of milk, just enough for the 300 thirsty children, by the way. Do you think Mr. Mueller felt like thanking God before he came? I'm not sure about that. It's a good, good question, isn't it? But he was thanking God that the food would come. He was thanking God, Lord, I know you'll provide for me. Let me just thank you. Let me be in the center of your will, and that's to thank you. I don't see the milk. I don't see the bread. But I'm going to thank you because your word that I know very well says, be thankful in all things always. Need some bread? Need some milk? Just enough for 300, by the way. That's God. That's our God. That's the God that we should be giving thanks to continuously, like the way we breathe. Always. It's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. Last one, very well known, very well known. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It's a memory verse. Philippians 4, 6. And I'll just read the whole verse. Be careful or be anxious for nothing, but in everything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Do we miss that part? With thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 
Did we miss the pinch of spice with thanksgiving? See, everybody quotes the verse. Well, you know, everything, be patient for nothing, brother. Prayer and what about the thanksgiving? The thanksgiving is the spice. That's the extra. That's the ingredient that's needed. Be patient for nothing. Pray. Intercede. Supplication. But do it with thanksgiving. As if God's going to do it. And if he doesn't do it, it's his will. You see? The spice is thanksgiving. And the last one, I'm not going to turn there, I'll just read it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. This one may sting a little bit. I exhort, or encourage, first of all, this is the Apostle Paul, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for Joe Biden, Kathy Hochul, all the politicians you hate and speak against, for kings and all those in authority. Now, I had a man come up to me not too long ago. I said, Yo, can you keep it, count on the politics? I can't take it. I will only speak about politics when the Bible speaks about politics. The Bible speaks about politics here. If you hate Joe Biden, you have a heart problem. You need to pray for him. According to the Apostle Paul, according to the Holy Spirit, you need to pray for the president who, guess who put him there? Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, put Joe Biden in office. Whether he got there justly or corruptly, he didn't fool God. You need to pray for Kathy Hochul, who you hate. You should be praying the same way the Apostle Paul prayed for Caesar Nero, who was taking Christian skins and using them to light torches. If he could do it, you and I can do it. You say, are you a Democrat? No, I'm a Christian. I am a Christ follower. That's why I'm not going to get caught up in the political circus because my passport, when I show it, says kingdom of heaven. Not the United States and not Kenya, not Italy and not India. It's the kingdom of heaven. That's where I'm headed. And I hope you are too. It supersedes it all. See, I told people in Kenya, I said, you know, in Kenya they call you Mzungu. It means white man. I only saw like two white people after 10 days. I saw two other white people there. But I said, you know, speaking to a group, I said, you call us Muzungu. I pray one day you call us Mutu Yamungu, man of God. Because we don't call you black man when we pray for you. When we're preparing, we don't call you black man. You see, the family of God, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue. What's the color? Red. The same color of the blood of the lamb. That's the part of family I'm, that's the family I'm part of. My passport is heaven. That's where I'm headed. I may be a United States citizen, but that's not going to supersede my citizenship that is in the kingdom of heaven. That's something you and I should be thankful for this Thanksgiving season, that all this will pass away, that we will pass through this land. This too shall pass. One will be raised up, another one will be put down. God changes the heart of kings. If we just follow what the Lord tells us, and a satanic agenda, I promise you, is to make you and make I unthankful people. He even took away Charlie Brown Thanksgiving special. That upsets me. Are you kidding me? Charlie Brown, 1960 started. Why? Because he, he has an Indian in there? I, I, that's where we've gotten to. Why? Because we became unthankful. We have too much. A pastor shared this with me, and I'll end with this. I had uh, lunch with a couple pastors recently. I did an interview with them and told me a very sobering statistic. He said, you know, according to one of the research groups, I don't know if it was Pew, I'm not sure which one it was. Last Sunday, listen now, last Sunday, 17% of Americans attended church. Now, I'm not good at math. That's less than one out of five. That's about 18% of this country even goes to a house of God anymore. You say, well, what about those doing house church? Fine, all right, let's raise it to 22%. That's still one out of five. Why? Because we're not thankful anymore. We're not thankful. We don't need God. We don't need to enter into those gates. We don't need to come back and, and thank God that he allows us to wake up. I mean, we just want him to heal us and we'll go on our merry way and bring no glory to God. 
This is a reality of what's called American Christendom, if that's even a term. No, we ought to be a people united by faith in Christ through the work of the cross. We should be loving God fervently with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the overflow will be loving neighbors as ourselves. Whether they're enemies or not, whether they're politicians, prayers, supplications, requests, be made for all men, for those in authority, for kings, for those at your school district, for those who are radically perverted right now, pushing a radically perverted agenda, what do you do? You pray for them. In God's strength, in God's spirit, and watch God do the work. Take your hand off it. It was mentioned Peter got an opportunity too to preach on one verse in Nambali. I, I asked to move around and Man, Will kind of alluded to it. One verse, 2 Peter, the last verse. The same man that chopped off Malchus' ear. The same man that said, I will never deny you, Jesus. And he did, three times. The last part of his second letter to the Christians scattered abroad. And Lord willing, that's where we're going to start. God willing, New Year's, 1 Peter. But he says, listen to this, this is the same Peter. Now, that sword, he drops it. No more picket lines, no more protests, no more chopping ears off. He says, but grow, grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Is this the same Peter? Yes, but it's converted Peter. It's a Peter who's filled with God's spirit it's a Peter who was crucified upside down. It's a Peter who understood it's got to be the strength of Christ. It can't be me. So I want to encourage you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus. As you get to know Jesus, one thing has to happen. You have to become more like him, gracious, giving people what they don't deserve, loving those that are unlovable, loving your enemies, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, that's the essence. That's the fragrance of Christ. That's how people are drawn to Christ. That's my prayer. Somebody asked me, one of those same pastors, well, what's your vision for the church? What's my vision for the church, I said. My vision for the church is this. Preach the gospel, teach the word of God, love people, pray for people, pray with people, Love them. That's my vision for the church. Well, what, well, what's going to happen? Well, God will do the rest. He'll add to his church daily. I don't have to worry about it. That's my vision. Be thou my vision. That's my vision. As long as I'm here. And I think the elders would agree with that. And the deacons and hopefully the rest of you. We don't have to come up with some brilliant strategic marketing plan. It's not a business. It's a church. God will grow things organically. If we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. Apart from him, we'll just be a shell. Won't do anything. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the opportunity to gather in your house. We thank you that you're adding to this church locally, that you're adding to your church universally. God, the time has come where we put down the labels, we put down the denominational walls, Father, we have such a small pool now in this country. The vast majority don't attend a house of God. They don't pray. They don't read. They don't love. We need to band together, Lord. You said, endeavor, work hard to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father above all who is in us all. Let that be the cry of Spencerport Bible Church and the body of Christ at large. Thank you for the kindness of the men and women here who have seen you and seen this truth. Let the walls fall down that separate us for things that, quite honestly, Lord, in your eyes are not very important. And let us be united by love and truth. Let us grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And all of Spencerport Bible Church said, Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you all.